So I'd like you to turn with me to 1 Corinthians, and sorry, 2 Corinthians and chapter 1. Why did I say 1 Corinthians? I don't really know why that was the case. Sometimes I do make mistakes, don't I? Um, right, so 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Now 2 Corinthians is the, it's a New Testament letter of 13 chapters written by Paul to the church at Corinth. Anybody know where Corinth was? In, uh, it was in Greece, that's right. In between Low <coughs> <coughs> Lower Greece and Macedonia above, there was this very thin bit of land, and that's called an isthmus. Those of you that do geography, do you know that? And uh, that's a very narrow strip of land, and uh, it, 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 nowadays you can actually sail a ship right through to the other side. But in those days, um, you had to get your ship and haul it over land and stick it back in the sea again because there was Corinth and there was Kencrea, two, two cities, um, very much united like twin cities and that's where Corinth was, so a very cosmopolitan place. So what you what you would think about today when you think of a motorway service station, always busy, always people moving on, people didn't stay there very long, they might stay the night or they might not even stay at all, but it was a very busy place. And Paul is <coughs> he's writing to his letter to them, probably in about 55 to 57 AD, something like that. And he writes to state his authority as an apostle. And we're going to see why that's important in a minute. But he also is writing to combat false teachers at Corinth. Now then, now Paul had written three letters already. Shall I say it again? Paul had written three letters already by now. Two of them are lost forever. No one's got one. If ever you hear that it's been found sometime, be amazing. <coughs> but no, those two letters are lost forever. And what we have in 1 Corinthians is actually the second letter of the group. Now, 1 Corinthians is the second letter. And this letter would be the fourth one in the group. Now this raises some interesting questions, doesn't it? You see, the Bible isn't everything that was ever written. People wrote a lot of stuff in those days and people wrote novels and they wrote semi-religious literature, they wrote fables, they wrote all sorts of stuff. And what we have is we have a copy now in our Bible of the parts of the Old Testament literature that were sanctioned by the Holy Spirit as being part of Scripture. See, when Paul wrote a letter to somebody, it didn't automatically become scripture unless God the Holy Spirit made it so. Okay? So Paul's first original letter, and it may not have been the first one, it's just the first one that we know about, um, that wasn't scripture, so the Holy Spirit has not preserved it for us. The second one was, and that's what we call 1 Corinthians, the third one wasn't, we know that it was an angry letter. We know that Paul was really cross for them and was telling them off. Well, we haven't got that. We don't know what he says. We know that it did right. We know they did sort themselves out. And now he writes this second letter to congratulate them. That they've sorted themselves out and they're now right with God again. Isn't it fascinating? The Bible, the Bible is an, am <coughs> the Bible is an amazing thing in that way. So his previous letter had been much stronger, but it had been successful. And the, the, the Corinthian believers had been willing to change their ways. Do you remember in the last letter there was a lot of stuff he taught them? Some of it was serious stuff. I mean, there was sexual immorality in the church, publicly. They were even proud of it. Wow. And so that's why the stern letter was necessary. But they've changed their ways and now he's writing a much easier letter to write. He also, I think, is probably writing slightly in a hurry. Now, we don't know why. It could be that he had a journey to take and he wanted to write the letter first. He always used amanuensis. Put your hand up if you know what amanuensis is. Both of my daughters had amanuensis at school. All through their school. Because like me, they had difficulty writing. Couldn't write quickly, couldn't write neat. So they asked for a manuensis. And a manuensis is someone that came to the examination and did the writing while they spoke. 
And they passed, of course, because they, they could think okay. They couldn't write it, that's all. It wasn't a writing exam, see? So therefore, they, if there wasn't a writing exam, then <coughs> they had help with the writing bit. Now, Paul always used the amanuensis, and sometimes it would be difficult to get one. And so therefore, um, he probably had to write in a hurry. And of course, at the end of most of his letters, he writes a little postscript in his own handwriting. And his own handwriting was quite distinctive. He always wrote in big letters. I had a friend of mine at school and he always wrote everything in big letters. In fact, he got an award for writing only two words on a line. They had an award for that. I think they were kidding him, but they gave him an award for writing two letters on a line. Um, he wrote big letters, you see. And it didn't mean big letters in the length of the letter. It meant big individual letters he wrote but in Paul's handwriting. Okay, so a few people, having, Paul had sorted out a lot of people. Now, let me give you a little tip in life, right? Here's a little tip, right? This is, a, this is a, something that happens all the time. When you sort people out, they get cross. Now, I'll tell you that again. When people get sorted out, they resent it and they get cross. Did you notice that at your work or at your school? If you have to ever sort somebody out, put them right, put them in order... They get cross and they don't like it. And that's what was happening here. They didn't like the fact that Paul had sorted them out. He was at least the founder of the church. He's the only person that could sort them out. But he had sort them out and they had not liked it. But they didn't say anything to his face. What they did, they went behind his back when he didn't know what was being said. And they whispered, That Paul... <laughs> Have you ever had that at work? I've seen it so many times, honestly. Oh, the boss has told me off. <laughs> Listen, what, what they were doing, what they were whispering behind his back, I don't like his legs, he's got bandy legs. The Apostle Paul isn't a little fellow, why should we take any notice of him? <laughs> he's got a strange accent, he comes from Galatia. We don't want to listen to Paul. He's a Jew anyway. What's that got to do with being a Christian? And they would niggle and niggle and niggle behind his back. Now Paul had been right. But you can sometimes undermine somebody by, by attacking their personality and their character. Got that now? Just today, in a conversation, having a conversation with somebody, and this, she's a godly lady, but she was wrong. So while I pointed out that she's wrong, what came next? A personal comment about me. See? A personal comment. That had got nothing to do with the argument. How come we've got personal all of a sudden? Because, you see, sometimes when people can't win an argument, they'll attack you. So be very careful when you win an argument, because sometimes they'll come for you instead. Okay. And that's what Paul is he's having to write the second letter. Now, he's the person that founded the church. He's having to write a letter to prove that he's a good person and that he's doing what God asked him to do. That's actually quite a disgrace, really, isn't it? These people wouldn't even been in the church if it wasn't for Paul preaching the gospel to them. Now he's going to have to defend who he is. That sometimes is what happens. So the letter then has three parts. The first part explains his current actions and his ministry. <coughs> the second part defends the collection of money for the poor Christians who live in Judea who are in a famine. Paul has to defend that. You wouldn't think anybody would have to defend famine relief, but Paul has to. And lastly, he defends his personal call from the Lord Jesus to the ministry God has given him. So let's plunge in. Verse 1 and 2, we have greetings from Paul and Timothy. And then uh, we then have, we go right through the, right through the letter. I won't, I won't read out the whole analysis of the letter. But we have the comfort of God, which begins in chapter 1, verse 3, and goes right the way down to chapter 7 verse 16 then we have the little bit about the collection for the poor saints in 8 and 9 and then we have Paul's personal call to apostleship and his responsibility to be a guardian for the church at Corinth that's from chapter 10 chapter 13 then we have farewells and blessings 
in the last bit. So let's look, go back to, let's go back to the first chapter in verse 1. We have greetings from Paul and Timothy. Now I find it particularly lovely that Paul includes Timothy. You know, <clears throat> Timothy was a great man eventually, but he probably wasn't great at this point. And what Paul did is he took this young man under his wing and he saw a lot of potential in him. And he said, I need you. I want to help. I want you to help me in this work. <coughs> and when Paul penned his letter to the church at Corinth, he put Timothy's name in there as well. Now, I think that's an amazing thing. Amazing thing. When Timothy either saw it being done or heard about it later or read about it later, he must have been chuffed beyond belief. Wow. He's included me. In scripture, he's included me with him in scripture. And he says, I'm writing to the church of God, which is at Corinth with all the other saints which are in Achaia, which just means Greece. Okay. <coughs> Let's go down again. Verse 2. He says, grace be to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a combination of the Christian and Jewish greeting. Grace or Chris, which is grace and shalom which is peace that's the, that's the greeting and then Paul begins by a hymn of praise I've never heard anybody commit this to music but it's a hymn of praise and he begins he says blessed be God the father of our Lord Jesus Christ the father of mercies and the God of all comfort who comfort <coughs> who comforteth us in our tribulation that we may be able to comfort them which are in trouble by the comfort whereby we ourselves are comforted of God. Now then, I want to ask you a question. Have you noticed in your Christian life, if you're a Christian, if you're not, you may notice it in other people's lives, have you noticed that troubles come? Now you may be going through some now, I don't know. I don't know what your circumstances are. Those, tr those troubles don't ask God to just take them all away, spit them all away. They come into our life under the sovereign hand of God to enable us to become stronger. And also they come into us so that we might then focus our attention on the Lord Jesus. They come into our lives <coughs> so that we might learn to pray. And they come into our lives so that we might be able to help people who are in trouble in the future. <laughs> Let's go through some of those. First of all, they come into our lives to make us strong. If you plant a little sapling near to the edge of a cliff, that will grow into a very powerful tree. Very more than normal. Why is that you say? Because the wind will come, the winters will come, the freezing rain will come and they'll beat upon that tree and that tree will have to learn to survive. And as the wind keeps moving it and moving it and moving it, what happens? I'll tell you what happens. The wood itself becomes stronger and stronger and stronger. I don't mean more brittle just more flexible and it'll 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 go with the wind you, you see the trees on the edge of a cliff and they're nearly that angle because in, the wind's been pushing them all the time but I tell you what you try and break some of it it's rock solid rock solid and that's what sometimes tribulation is in our lives it enables us to become stronger okay it does something else too tell me whether this is true put your hand up if you've known this true in your life that when troubles come, you pray more. Is that true? Absolutely. Now let me ask you something. Does God want you to pray more? Yes. Well then what God wants to do in your life is to bring more trouble. Because then you'll pray more. Is that true? Yes. Because it isn't the trouble that's meant to break you. The trouble is meant to strengthen you. But... In the midst of your trouble, you get on your knees and you say, Lord, I've had it now. I can't do anything else. I'm just absolutely at the end of my tether. And I'm going to trust in you to do what I can't do at all. And then all of a sudden, he does it. And you think, oh, thank goodness for that. But what have you done? You've learned to pray 
You've learnt to trust and you've learnt to rejoice in the answer to prayer. That's why troubles come. But they also come for other reasons. Margaret went through a very deep bereavement a few years ago. Why did that happen? I'll tell you why it happened. You went through a bereavement, didn't you, sir? I'll tell you why that happened. Because one of these days, I might lose somebody. And you can come to me and say, Stephen, I understand. So you're then able to bring to me the comfort which you have received from the Lord and pass it to me. Let me ask you something. If you never went through any struggles, what sort of a Christian would you be? Well, I tell you what, first of all, if you never had troubles and never had struggles in life, you'd be the sort of Christian that's weak as a kitten. Weak as a kitten. You need to become strong. One of the most common exhortations in Scripture is, be strong in the Lord. <coughs> Not be strong in yourself, but be strong in the Lord. That's the first thing. The second thing is that the troubles that you receive enable you to become experienced. And, when, and in fact, I've had bereavement in my life, very deep bereavement, and I have to go do, conduct a funeral. I have to go visit a family that's grieving. How do I do that? I just stand there and say, I lost my mother. And they say, Oh, I understand. Or I say, I've lost my father. Can't talk to him now. He's with the Lord. Would I pay a thousand pounds to travel anywhere to talk to him? Yes, but I can't. And there's that deep, deep bereavement and separation. Now, those things that happen to me enable me to help someone that's going through the same. So, isn't that wonderful what Paul teaches us here? <clears throat> He says, we are able to comfort those who are in trouble. The word comfort means to put your big arm around them. That's what comfort means. But we're, <coughs> we're able to comfort them because we have been comforted of God. What's that mean? It means God himself has put his big arm around you and comforted you. That's an amazing thing. Amazing thing. Now then, verse 5 and 6 and 7. <coughs> Paul reminds them that he suffers for his faith so that they might be blessed and for their deliverance. You see, Paul was one of these wonderful people uh, in life who takes all the flack for everybody else. Have you heard of Eddie Murphy? Yeah. Put your hand up. You heard of Eddie Murphy? What's he famous for? Doing films in the films yeah he is famous for the films but you know he's more famous for something else the most highly decorated soldier in the American army ever before he I think was only 22 he'd won so many medals for bravery wow and you say well how, how'd you do that he put himself deliberately in harm's way right in front of the enemy so that all his mates could escape now that's bravery and that's what Paul did. He says, I like to take all of the suffering on me so that you can slip away and escape. That's amazing. And Paul went through horrendous suffering for the Lord. Why? So that they might be blessed. So they might be delivered. <coughs> and he, Paul says, and we know that God will deliver you, knowing that your suffering is the road to blessing. Verse 8, 9, 10, 11. Paul counts some of the trouble that he faced in Asia. Now it's Turkey. We call it Turkey today. In those days it was called Asia, but we sometimes call it Asia Minor. He says we faced unbearable pressure. Now we can only imagine what that is. Imagine when you face unbearable pressure. You cannot bear it. <coughs> you cannot <coughs> bear it anymore. That's unbearable pressure. He says it was beyond our ability to endure it. That we thought that we would just be murdered on the spot. That's the sort of unbearable pressure you're going to receive. 
that he received. He says the sentence of death caused us to just give up on ourselves altogether. We didn't trust in ourselves at all. We just thought there's nothing we can do. That's the sort of pressure he was under. He says, but in God, right, he is able, even if we die for the faith, to be raised again to glory. The only thing that got them through those days is this, that they knew as soon as the knife cut or as soon as the sword cut, they'd be immediately in the presence of the Lord Jesus. That's the thing that got them through. That's the thing that never made them afraid. They weren't afraid, really. His, uh, when, you, when you read the annals of the, of the martyrdoms of the Christians of those days, they all marched into, into, in, into danger singing. Because they knew that if death came, it would be immediately in the presence of the Lord Jesus. They weren't afraid of him. You see. And he says, and God, God delivered us, and he will continue to deliver us. Why? <coughs> because we're trusting in him for our future. Trusting in him for our future. Your prayers have been a small blessing to us. Sorry, they've been a great blessing to us. And your gift of money has been the means of a lot of thanksgiving. Paul, you see, when you're being persecuted, you can't work. Paul got to the point where he had nothing to eat. No wonder the gift was greatly received. <coughs> Verse 12, but our rejoicing is in this. Now listen carefully to this. Our rejoicing is in this, that we have a clear conscience before God. And that in simplicity and godly sincerity, and not in human cleverness, but by the grace of God, this is how we live in the world. Now you know what, that should be written on a plaque and stuck above my mantelpiece. I'll read it to you again, it's fantastic. He says, <clears throat> our rejoicing is this. That we have a clear conscience before God. Let me tell you something. Have you ever had a time in your life when you've not had a clear conscience before God? That's a fearful place to be. I will suggest actually that no Christian exists in the world that's never been there. I remember when I first became a Christian, the conscience I had was such that it would take me straight down into hell itself if it could. Bad conscience. Bad conscience before God. Terrible thing. He says, but there's something else even more wonderful. And that is a good conscience. Just the concept that you can look at God in the face and there's nothing to be embarrassed about. That's a, that's a good conscience. So uh, our rejoicing is this, that we have a clear conscience before the Lord. And that in simplicity... There's no cleverness about Paul's life whatsoever, but in complete sin simplicity and godly sincerity. That means that Paul had no ulterior motives. That's what simplicity means. Paul didn't have another agenda. I meet people all the time. And you get to know them, and you get to like them, and all the rest of it. Then you discover that they're after something. Is that true? Have you found people like that? They've got something they want from you and they're going to bide their time until they ask you. Listen, Paul says, I don't have anything. I don't have anything I want from you. In simplicity and godly sincerity. Sincerity means without wax. It, in those days, they would take a, a marble statue and carve a picture of a... I'll do a pose. Carve a picture of a lady like this. Remember that? You've seen them about, haven't you? Beautiful, made of marble. Looks really like human skin. Of course, if the arm falls off, it looks a bit strange. But anyway, um, and as the artist is doing it, if he goes ding and the nose falls off, he's spoiled it, isn't he? Ah, but he's clever, you see. <coughs> what he does, he goes home and he says, wife, where's those candles? And she gives him the candles and he cuts them up and he mixes the colours until he gets exactly the right colour to match the stone. And then what he does is he get he's, it's very clever. I used to do this with, with antique restoration. And he will model it, model it and push it up and do it. And in the end it looked absolutely perfect. But if you were the buyer of the statue, buyer beware. What you do is you'd say, Oh, it looks lovely. I'd like to just pop it out there in the Grecian sun. And they'd take the model and put it in the sun. And what would happen? Bing! The nose would drop off. Because the wax would get hot and fall off. 
And so that word see, it means to be without wax. It means to be 100% genuine. When you looked at the life of the Apostle Paul, you saw what you really saw. There was nothing else to see except what you just saw. And so the question for all of us is this. <coughs> I know what you're like on a Sunday morning, but are you the same on a Sunday night? And what are you like on a Monday morning at work? Are you the terror of your work or are you a good Christian there like you are on a Sunday morning? Sincerity means consistency. It means being genuine through and through. That's what Paul says we were. Our rejoicing is we have a clear conscience before God in simplicity and godly, godly sincerity and not in human cleverness but by the grace of God we live in the present world. What an amazing thing to say. Let's move on. Verse 13 and 14. Paul says, what you read here is what I think. What you read here is what I think. I have not, I have not written anything different anywhere else. And I believe that you will find that this will always be the case and forever. That doesn't mean to say Paul won't learn new things. Of course he will. But what he's saying is this, and I've met ministers and Christians, and they'll say one thing one day, but the next day in different company they'll say something else. That isn't consistent. And you will not find in Paul's writings one thing being said and then he contradicts himself in the next book. He's not like that. Paul is probably, in my mind, one of the most honest, straightforward and consistent people that I've ever known about <coughs> he says I know that some of you have acknowledged our ministry to you and rejoice let me say this we rejoice in you too when the Lord will come and take us all home to heaven verse 15 and 16 I wanted to come and visit you before about uh, so that you might have a second benefit of my ministry. Now immediately the charismatics will jump on this verse and say, there you are, it's a second blessing. Paul says, I want to come and bring to you a second blessing. No, he doesn't mean it like that. He doesn't mean some sort of a second blessing of a charismatic nature. What he means is, I was able to bless you in the past, I'd like to come and see you again and bless you again. I'd like you to have a second dose of the same medicine. Because it will bring you life and health and you'll move on in your Christian life. He says, I wanted to pass by you and to visit Macedonia. And then afterwards come to visit you. And then after that, I'd like to go to Judea. Verse 17. He says, was I joking? <laughs> was I joking? Or was I just thinking as the world thinks? To think like this. Doing what I think is best. Is that what Paul's life was about? Was Paul's ministry a joke? No, it wasn't a joke. He wasn't play acting. This was deadly serious stuff. I wasn't, I wasn't using the thinking of this world. And I wasn't just doing what I think is best. He says, but God is true. <coughs> Verse 18. And our ministry to you was not yes and no or maybe it wasn't like that at all and I hope that my ministry at this church is not like that I know that some people get frustrated with me sometimes when they say Stephen you're too dogmatic I say well I'd rather be dogmatic than unclear I'd rather people went away and say I didn't agree with that than people go away saying I didn't understand it you see but we need to be dogmatic about certain things that are definitely right of course we do he says we, that is Timothy and Silas and me, we preach the Son of God, Jesus Christ to you. We were not in any doubt as to the truth of the message we brought and it was definite and clear he'd had no doubts about it. It was a definitely yes, yes, that's the truth and that's the way it'll have to be for me. That's the way it ought to be for you. We do not, when people say to me, well, ask me a question. 
I don't say, oh, I don't know. Well, occasionally I do, because I don't know everything. But in the main, I don't say I don't know. And I don't give five answers. I remember talking to a young theological student coming out of college. He just finished his degree in theology. And I asked him what he believed about certain things, because I was interested. And he, he looked at me, and he said, frankly, I don't know. I said, well, that's a lot of good, isn't it? Going to a theological college, and you come out, and you don't know what you believe. He said, well, you don't know what it's like. I said, what do you mean? What is it like? He said, you go into a lecture and they give you five answers to the question. I said, well, did they not tell you which was the right one? He went, no. They just leave you hanging. He said, I even went to a lecture and they gave us 15 answers to a question. I said, there aren't 15 answers. There's just one. Which one is it? Just which one is it? Just be yes and yes. Don't say yes and no and maybe. No, no. It's just what is the truth of this? What is the truth of this? He said, and that's what we were like. He says in verse 20, he says, because all the promises of God in him are yes. And in him, amen, unto the glory of God. We don't, as Christians, have to shilly-shally around. We do not have to shilly-shally around. There are differences of opinion about things, I understand. But the scripture doesn't change. And when you, uh, when you quote a scripture to somebody, that's not yes and no, or maybe. That's what the scripture says. The only question that hangs then is this. Not, what does the scripture say? But what do you think it means? That's all that hangs. And you just cannot make this mean anything you like. Recently I had a long conversation with a theologian. And I said, well, I want to tell you very frankly what I think you're doing. You go, what's that? I said, I think you're just making it up. Whatever you think is the answer, you think that's the answer. I said, look, that isn't how we deal with scripture at all. The scripture is right. The only question is, what does it mean? That's all. Now then, verse 21. The one who establishes us is with you in Christ. And who has anointed us is God. The one who establishes you in Christ and who has anointed us is God. God also has placed his mark of ownership upon us and has given us a token of blessing. And the Holy Spirit has he put into our hearts. When did he do that? Where does the Holy Spirit come into your heart? The moment you're saved. In fact, Paul says, if you haven't got the Holy Spirit, then you're not a Christian. So this idea, like they did in the Welsh Revival, bless them, of saying, we're waiting for the Holy Spirit to come. Well, he was in the heart of everybody that was a believer already there. It wasn't a question of waiting for the Holy Spirit to come. It was waiting for a heart of obedience to come into the hearts of the believers who had the Holy Spirit. And that became evident in the Revival. Verse uh, 23-24. And more than this, I call on God to witness that I have not come to Corinth yet to spare you. Now, let me just stop a minute and say, Paul hadn't gone to Corinth recently for one reason. Because if he'd arrived there, he'd have been very cross and they wouldn't have liked it. You see, is it right for a minister of the gospel to get cross? Absolutely it is. There's such a thing as righteous indignation. There's such a thing as righteous indignation. That's a Christian duty. When you're faced with evil in this world, the person that keeps his mouth shut is wrong. You can't keep your mouth shut in face of evil. He says, I've spared you by coming to you so far. Not that we are in charge of you, he says. <coughs> but we want to help you. So that you might rejoice in the Lord, because it is by trusting in God that you stand firm. That's all, Paul, that's all Paul wanted. He just wanted them to stand firm in the Lord. Not trusting in themselves, but trusting in the Lord to keep them strong and to keep them safe. And that's a great place to end this morning, isn't it? This is what our prayer for you is. It's what my prayer for all of you is this. That you will stand strong in the Lord. Not in me or anybody else. But you will stand strong in the Lord. And you'll trust in him. There we are. <coughs>